Everyone's talking about COVID shots for kids. Let's talk about why more Colorado parents aren't immunizing their kids for anything. Douglas County can't quit mass mandates no matter how hard it tries, as hospitalizations are at 2021 highs and going higher, as about 20 Coloradans die a day. The lesson of a lost hiker has been made out to be some kind of millennial thing. I would like to speak in our defense. And get in, loser, we're going voting. It increases access for us no matter what zip code you live in. Voting by van is legal. So let's go next. Headline everywhere today is that FDA advisors are recommending approval of Pfizer's COVID vaccine for kids 5 to 11. Final decision on that could come in days. Here's what gets ignored in that discussion. Whether it is anti-vax misinformation or the health care disparities exposed by the t pandemic, Colorado's childhood vaccination rates are low and dropping fast. Again, we're not talking COVID vaccines. We're talking about vaccines for things like measles. The decrease in childhood immunizations stems from just that lack of access to providers. And so we've seen those numbers go down at alarming rates where we really need to make sure that there's a, a big focus on all of our vaccines for children. You know, early in the pandemic, the dropping childhood vaccination rates were blamed on the lockdowns. Kids weren't going to the doctor. But those rates were falling in Colorado prior to COVID, and they have kept plummeting after things opened up. Colorado's Vaccine Equity Task Force says that for kids 0 to 2, vaccine rates are down 10 percent. Kids age 3 to 9, they're down 16 percent. Declining confidence in vaccines and or access is happening right as the COVID vaccine for young children nears approval. To parents, I'd say continue to ask for information that's going to help you make a decision and get it from someone that you trust who is a healthcare provider or who knows a lot about these vaccines from a scientific um, and data perspective. Colorado's childhood vaccination rates were in the bottom ha half nationwide prior to the pandemic. Our plan statewide for COVID-19 vaccinations for young kids is to have them be available primarily through schools and community centers, not through the mass vaccination sites used for adults. Anti-maskers in Douglas County took another loss today. Court ruled in favor of Doug Coe schools. The district wants to keep its mask mandate even after Republican County commissioners fired their public health experts and appointed themselves in charge to get rid of mask mandates. So you essentially have just a big political fight over masks there. You've got the GOP county commissioners who disassembled the health department to opt out. And then you have school board members who are supported by Democrats who are in favor of a district mask mandate. School board meetings in Dugco have devolved into some pretty disturbing stuff lately with anti-maskers claiming that there are snipers on the roof and comparing masks to the Nazi extermination of the Jews. We're, of course, a week out for election from Election Day, and there's a school board meeting in Douglas County tonight. We're keeping an ear on it for you. Douglas County's breakup with Tri-County Health Department made it by county Health Department, and now Adams County bailed today, so it is just County Health Department, Arapahoe County, all by its lonesome. Even some small government types like Aurora Mayor Mike Kaufman said today that breaking up Tri-County Health Department to create three separate ones could cost taxpayers substantially more. And of course, the virus still does not care about politics. It is busily putting bodies in the hospital. Another increase today in Colorado's COVID hospitalizations. More than a third of our hospitals are expecting staff shortages in the next week as Colorado keeps increasing its highest hospitalization totals of 2021. Close to 1,200 COVID patients in Colorado's hospitals. The vast majority are from the unvaccinated minority. Highest patient count since last December, before the vaccine was widely available. Just being in a hospital with COVID-19 means that you're very sick. People who are in an ICU on a ventilator, even if, if it's just for a few days, will have lasting consequences, whether those are lifetime lasting consequences, days, weeks, months. Uh, that's still unknown. Healthcare workers, as distrusted as they are by some who eventually come in desperate for care, they've gotten a lot better at treating serious cases. So mortality has decreased significantly over time. Uh, that being said, now we have people who are completely naive to the disease, that is the unvaccinated, and they get profoundly ill. And for the last month, about 18 to 20 Coloradans diagnosed with COVID are still dying each day. 18 to 20, that's the statistic that we don't often see. Cities that are trying to return to something like normal, 
even as COVID continues to go th through mostly unvaccinated people in the population. Some of those cities have considered requiring proof of vaccinations in order to be able to eat in a restaurant. New York and L.A. have already done it. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock told us today, not yet. But it would be too early for us to take anything off the table. And, um, and certainly um, we, don't, we, we, don't, we don't want to be premature in terms of putting, uh, putting in a policy that we haven't uh, been able to verify or, or allow data to, to sustain itself to tell us we need to make changes. We caught up with the mayor today as he announced the Denver's outdoor dining program is going to become permanent. Not sure about you. I don't know. Winter night, I would rather have the fully vaxxed indoor dining experience, but huddling by a heater in a tent for another winter, I guess, is better than nothing. Call it blackmail. Call it an incentive. The state sure got RTD's attention by threatening to withhold millions of dollars in federal aid unless RTD restarted its bus routes to Boulder and Longmont. Well, today, we learned that Boulder County may have brokered a truce that'll bring the buses back. Steve Stager's our man on planes, trains, automobiles, and bikes, and buses. Steve, RTD will loudly tell you that a bag of money cannot drive a bus. Unfortunate, right? Yeah, they need drivers to do that. That was the argument of RTD's leadership. Like the rest of the world right now, they are short-staffed. They don't have the drivers to restart bus lines. And when you're forced to take drivers away from other lines, you might be hurting people who actually need and rely on transit. Now, here's some background. CDOT's executive director, Shoshana Liu, wrote to RTD leadership last week saying that she would withhold this $34 million in American Rescue Plan money intended for transit in Boulder, Longmont, and Lafayette. In order to get it, RTD had to commit to restarting two Flatiron Flyer bus routes, which run along US 36, and two express bus lines from Longmont. All of those lines were closed because of the pandemic. One RTD board member representing Northeast Denver and part of Aurora wrote an op-ed in the Denver Post this week accusing Lou of holding policy decisions to ransom. She says that RTD doesn't have the operators to make these sudden changes and that they'll really have to study whether restoring service here would impact low-income communities and communities of color that rely on transit. I don't think it's a, we are intentionally working to, you know, upset folks in, in Boulder or Longmont or in Lafayette, but rather that we are really focusing our efforts on those who are utilizing our services right now. We don't have enough operators. And so when we're talking about adding service or reinstating service, we have to do so in a way um, that understands the impact the deputy director of transportation planning in Boulder County told me today that under this agreement, Boulder County would get $34 million, then use it to work with RTD and the other agencies in that community to restart transit lines. A spokeswoman for RTD told me she was unaware of this agreement, though RTD's board is set to discuss relief funds and executive decision during their meeting tonight, Kyle. This all really boils down to those lines that were shut down because of the pandemic yeah. and trying to get them back online. But RTD, like everyone else right now, is having trouble finding people to come to work. So I don't know if you remember, Steve, uh, when Next went on the air five years ago, we used to have a lot of fun with that A-line train that didn't work. Um, but that was because RTD was a, a functional transit agency that had one train that was on the struggle bus. The state keeps going hard after RTD. And I mean... They're kicking them when they're down. I mean, they've got budget issues. They can't find staff. They're having trouble servicing routes where people want them. It's just a tough situation over there. You know, and we've been talking about that operator shortage for a long time, even before the pandemic. Things leveled out during the pandemic because all of a sudden you had enough operators for the routes. But right as things started getting built up back up again, they're going through the exact same thing they did before. And now they're kind of saying to the state, look, we would love to start these bus lines back up too. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the resources. And if we're able to get the resources, we might be able to figure that out. Steve Sager, you missed him. He's back from his honeymoon. Thank you, Steve. Don't tell the election rigging conspiracy theorists, but there are people voting in that van. It's totally legal. So don't go all fat, you know what about it. Hey, speaking of. And so they're very smart. They're very smart little guys. They're kind of important to Colorado's environment. So uh, this spooky season, let's appreciate them. Next. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger told us he had a story about Hall and Oates today. He told us that even though voting is a one-on-one -on -one thing for private eyes, Marshall claimed that you can vote in some van they drive around town. I can't go for that. But apparently any voter can. Before you feel out of touch... You should know I misheard, Marshall. It's not Hall and Oates, so close. It's Hall and Votes. Colorado voters love to return their mail-in ballots. Yay! Yay, 
Thank you for voting. With hundreds of drop boxes statewide, most voters return the ballot that gets sent to them compared to voting in person. Voting in person is so low, especially in odd numbered years. Wait a minute, what's this? I saw the voting stand here on campus and decided to just go vote in person and I was really excited about it. Like I was saying, voting in person is, ah, come on. I just think voting in person is a lot better. Anna and Annabelle are two DU students who just happened to vote in person today using one of Denver's two mobile voting units. This one is called, and you'll need to remember this for later, Hall in Votes. There's a possibility I would have forgotten if I hadn't seen this here on campus. A lot of people forget, at least based on previous odd year election turnout. In 2019 in Denver, 164,000 people voted. Only two out of five voters returned a ballot, and just 2% voted in person. So why did Denver deploy a second mobile voting unit this year? Our voting centers are not just polling places. You can go and request a ballot. You can go and, and, and update your information. This new voting coach was paid for with federal grant money. It can stand alone as a polling place and help in an emergency, like a power outage or blizzard. It increases access for us no matter what zip code you live in. When you ask how do we reach out to voters, well, number one is we send a ballot to every single voter. Jefferson County also has a mobile voting unit. It's just not in use in this odd year election. Out of almost 200,000 Jefferson County votes in 2019, less than 1% were in person. We found that our mobile vote center makes a lot more sense in, say, a June primary when everyone's out and about because it's beautiful June in Colorado. Colorado. We've increased the number of drop boxes. In Arapahoe County in 2019, out of more than 160,000 votes, less than 2% were in person. We do have fewer vote centers, but that's because we have less people who want to vote in person. Don't tell that to DU students who are not so out of touch that they did it in a minute. And other Hall and Oates references you didn't just pick up on. Because, you know, they voted in person at Hall and Votes instead of returning their ballot by mail. I still would have voted. I probably would have voted a lot later, but yeah, I still would have voted. So we've joked about Holland votes. You heard the motor coach. Before I left that interview, right as I was leaving the interview with the clerk uh, and recorder of Denver, they were joking about they haven't named it yet, and perhaps they should crowdsource the name, Kyle. And we all know if you do that, it's going to be Voter McVoteface. So we don't want to do that. So I think we need to figure out the, the voter coach, what perhaps that should be called. We definitely do not want uh, people to send us ideas of what they could call the voting motor coach uh, at next at 9news.com via email or hey next on Twitter. We don't want you to do that. That would not be a helpful thing to do. All right. Thank you, Marshall. We know that representation matters in government because it can drive changes to priorities and policy that better reflect the interests of more people in our community. And now there's political science research from CU Boulder that seems to prove that. So women are winning more seats in national legislatures and parliaments around the world these days. And CU researchers found that more women in politics does have a meaningful impact on legislation, up to a point. The research found that female leaders often favor spending on education and health care, while male leaders prioritize security and transportation. This study found that when women occupy 15 to 35 percent of a country's legislature, health care spending jumps. And when women make up 20 to 40 percent of the legislature, education spending gets a bump. It's sort of contributing to this broader argument that like descriptive representation leads to meaningful changes, um, like meaningful substantive outcomes. It's not just a symbolic thing, though that in and of itself is important. Now, past that threshold, the research found that the impact of women in politics tends to plateau. So there's a majority of women in Colorado's House, has been for years. The researchers told us today they need to do some additional study to see if their findings apply to state and local governments. A powerful fall storm is making its way over Colorado. It was windy, warm, temperatures in the 70s earlier today. High wind warnings are posted, an air quality alert for the eastern plains for blowing dust in the high country. It's accumulating snow, three to six inches of snow, more rain and wind coming into Denver tonight, and that winter weather advisory goes through midnight for the Colorado high country, where the snow will continue tomorrow. The rain moves out this evening. We have a cool, windy, but dry day tomorrow. Upper 50s Wednesday, close to 70 by Friday and cloudy and dry but chilly for Halloween. Some of our neighbors need a reminder that pets off leash chasing wildlife. That's not high in Colorado. So good majority of what shows up on the local news falls into one of these two basic categories. You've got your dumb and your illegal. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is reminding Coloradans this week that letting your dog chase wildlife is both. You're in this area here. 
And if your dog kills some wild animal? You as the dog owner can be held liable for your dog's actions. Um, and since that was considered you know, an illegal take, um, since the dog had killed them, um, that comes with a, a pretty hefty fine. And if preserving wildlife isn't enough incentive, there is, there's your life too. We've told you about incidents where a dog will take after a moose and the moose ends up stomping both the dog and the owner. Lost hiker on Mount Albert made national news this week, mainly because people were making fun of him and other millennials. So I, I guess this guy got lost, called search and rescue for help, but then did not pick up their repeated return calls because they were coming to his cell phone from an unknown number. It turned out fine. He found his way back to his car 24 hours later. And everybody is dragging this, this millennial guy for letting calls go to voicemail. I don't know search and rescue. There are lots of millennials that hike, including here in Colorado. Maybe next time you should learn to text. I think it's great to have a week just to celebrate the bat. Colorado doesn't celebrate shark week lack of a coast and such. We do have Bat Week, which is almost cooler because they're all over Colorado and they won't kill you. That's next. It's Bat Week, mothers and fathers and children of all ages. Bats are more than Halloween decorations. They are our neighbors and kind of key to keeping Colorado's ecosystem functioning. A lot of times Halloween you know, you got skeletons, you got bats, you got skulls, you know, and they kind of portray the bat in kind of a negative way, you know, but uh, nothing negative about them. Okay, let's see here. My name's Jack Murphy. I am the president and director of Urban Wildlife Rescue. This is a group of bats that I removed by hand from the basement of an apartment building over by Cheeseman Park. This is the container I usually use if I have to get a bat out of somebody's house. Pick the bat up in this and put him in here. Then I can take him outside and let him go. Well, to me, the humane removal of every animal is very important. But for bats, if bats were all of a sudden gone tomorrow, we would have a serious problem with, uh, with insects, mainly mosquitoes. No, they're just kind of neat little guys. The closest relative to the bat uh, is the primate. So they're very closely related to us. And so they're very smart. They're very smart little guys. You know, I would get a bat in and the bat's all hissing and spitting and upset because you got him. And then you give him a couple of mealworms and all of a sudden he's your best friend, you know? And so they're, they're a pretty neat little animal. It's really good that in the last 25 or 30 years, people have begun to become educated about bats. And so they now realize that bats are beneficial. They also realize that bats don't fly into your hair, that bats don't attack you. Uh, you know, they're just small little flying mammals and they're really harmless to people, but they're also a great benefit to people. If you're educated and learn about bats, you realize that they're no threat whatsoever. The bats, this mustache, remember, mesmerizing. Colorado Parks and Wildlife told our photojournalist Corky Scholl there are 18 known species of bat in our state, and their researchers track all of them, trying to keep them safe from humans. Feedback tonight on what happens to unvaccinated Coloradans who are fortunate enough to leave the hospital after COVID. Next. Susan Doyle in Arvada writes tonight, when an unvaccinated person is admitted to the hospital with COVID, are they made to get the vaccine if they survive? They're not, Susan. For starters, they're gonna have natural immunity for some period of time, and nobody's getting forced to get the vaccine. They may be forced to, say, choose between their job and the shot or a restaurant and reservation of the shot, but not forced. 